Hello, this is Claudia Phylos with the Center for Hellenic Studies, and I'm so pleased to be joined today by our special guest, Maria G. Zanthu. Thank you for joining us, Maria. Thank you very much uh, all for coming. Thank um, you for inviting me. Oh, you're welcome. And I also want to welcome all our guests joining us actually from around the world. Um, and so I invite our guests when they speak and, uh, or ask a question or comment that they introduce themselves and share their name and where they're from. Um, but I'd like to start off, Maria, just by introducing you and your work. Um, you know, you're probably very well known to many of the people who've watched our videos before because you've joined us both as a participant and as, um, as a visiting scholar in the past. You had joined us to talk about mothers of heroes and monsters, Althea and Kalihre. Can you help me with that? I forget uh, how to uh, Kalira, Gerion's mother. Right. Um, and so, but I just want to share a bit, a bit about your background. So, um, Maria, you are a specialist in classical languages and literature and thought. Uh, you have been teaching classical languages at the University of Thessaloniki since 2002. And you have also been an adjunct lecturer at the Open University of Cyprus since 2012. You're a research collaborator. Um, of the Center for Greek Languages at Thessaloniki, and you're currently an appointed teaching fellow in classics and ancient history at the University of Leeds. Uh, you know, you have a wide range of interests that include Greek lyric poetry, um, Attic comedy, Attic rhetoric, history of classical scholarship, textual criticism, literary theory. Um, and so you have allowed us in the past to really go deeper into the text, not just when you have led the discussion, but also as a participant. Your questions have always been so thoughtful. Uh, so we're so grateful you're joining us today. I just want to remind everyone that you are also, um, in addition to being teaching fellow at the University of Leeds, you're also a research fellow in Pindaric Studies at the Center for Hellenic Studies for 2016-2017. Uh, and in the past, your work at the center has really been uh, revolving around uh, research relating to the social and cultural construction of fear and awe and anger um, and such emotions in the 5th and 4th century BC political scene in Attica. So um, I know today we're going to be talking about Pindar and we're so excited to have this discussion with you. In particular we're going to be talking about uh, the Pythian 3 and Pythian 9 uh, and you're going to bring in some comparative text and I know another a topic that you're really interested in today is thinking about the idea of Nostos. So um, at this point, I want to invite you to just introduce us and our, and our viewers to uh, these two Pythian odes. Can you just orient us? What are these uh, texts about? And um, how can we start thinking about them? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Janet and Sarah, for inviting me. Ellen, everyone there. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, CH, Harvard CHS and its director uh, for giving the opportunity uh, to participate in your wonderful uh, intellectual company and also in uh, giving me the opportunity to, to collaborate in this wider project of uh, uh, editing an online commentary on Pinder's Nemea Notes. Um, why uh, Pythian 3.9? Well, this started as a, a close reading of these three odes. And what, strike, what uh, strikes me as uh, especially interesting was that the myth, the mythical narrative of uh, these two odes evolved around two um, what I would call girlish uh, figures uh, that um, in, in uh, which uh, Apollo fan fell in love. Uh, in Pythian 3, this girl, uh, this girl is called Coronis. It's the mother of Asclepios. This is what uh, Pindar, uh, how uh, Pindar defines her. And in Pythian 9, this uh, figure, this girl, uh, Apollo falls in love with is uh, is Cyrene, uh, the the famous maiden that uh, gave its name or her name to uh, the famous colony Cyrene in Libya. Um, both girls are unique in uh, in their own. Um, what we, I would call identity, because 
all of them, uh, to, both of them, represent uh, an independent volition, an independent, um, I, what I would call personality, because they want to implement a particular independent course of action. And uh, I will give you a, a very specific uh, example. For example, in uh, uh, the narrative, the mythical narrative of uh, Coronis, uh, as you probably have read in Pythian uh, 3, um, Coronis, uh, Apollo fell in, uh, in love with Coronis. But in the meanwhile, um, she gets uh, pregnant to, uh, 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 with Apollo's seed, but uh, she also uh, on the other hand, disobeys, in quote marks, this uh, um, godly, godlike uh, love, and uh, and um, she goes away with Isis, which is uh, her father's uh, guest. So, in a way, um, Apollo gets angry. Uh, she uh, she dies uh, suddenly. Uh, Apollo gets uh, Asclepios out of her womb, and uh, this is how the famous uh, what I would call the, se the the demigod of medicine is being born or is brought to life. Cyrene represents another. Um, fascinating aspect of what we might call girl power because Cyrene is an adept huntress in a way she she bears the same characteristics with uh, Artemis with Apollo's um, sister Artemis and uh, she, Apollo also fell in love with her but I must say that this kind of love is in a way has a more happy ending because uh, Cyrene is uh, awarded gifts by uh, Apollo and of course she is uh, awarded with the gift of life. She is not destroyed. Coronis uh, who is uh, uh, destroyed after, utterly because she meets uh, death. Um, so this is uh, what I wanted, and uh, I've already uh, wrote about this in an article of mine. Is I wanted to explore this of girlish power. Um, so this is what I found especially fascinating, and this is what I wanted to um, uh, to present to you. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. okay. So can you so can you start it? Yes, absolutely. Um, first of all, um, I would like to start with um, something uh, with um, something that I read with a passage that I read uh, in uh, Greg Nash's famous uh, book, uh, almost classic. Uh, uh, Pindar's uh, Homer, the, the lyric uh, possession of an epic pa past. And I've already sent it this, uh, I think, yes, uh, in, uh, in my handout. Like, uh, Sarah, would you be kind enough to read it uh, uh, for us? Uh, I, is it possible? Yeah, yes, where do you want me to start? Um, it's, the, it's like it's the essence of the Korean lyric poetry. Uh, like it, uh, if you go, a typical Pindaric composition is on the third line. The starting point is on the third line. A Pindaric composition presents itself as local in foundation, expressed through the performance of the chorus, and as Panhellenic in intent, expressing the links of the song with the Homeric world of. Heroes. But the actual poetry of Homer must be made to look too compromising in face of the uncompromising standard proclaimed by Pindaric song. 
what we have already observed in the case of Stasikaris applies to his tradition too puts a strong emphasis on its association with the visual metaphor distinct from the auditory metaphor that marks the Homeric tradition, and an equally strong emphasis on the truth value of local traditions grounded in cult as distinct from the synthetic complexities attributed to Homer. Just as the voice of Stesicharis in his Helen song proclaims that his version of the Logos, tale of Helen, is etumos, genuine, by virtue of claiming that the control of the Kleos glory is etumon, genuine, in verse 63. Earlier in the same song, the Logos, the tale of and by the crafty Odysseus, as retold with commensurate craft by Homer, is described as going beyond the bounds of aletheia, truth, to which most men are blind without the vision that is implicit in Pindar's lyric poetry, an uncompromising, unified vision that defends the value of heroes from the compromising complexities of mythoi, myths, which are the hearsay of Homer. Uh, can you also please um, uh uh, read the translation of Pindar's Nemean 7, but it is also that uh, escorts this uh, beautiful passage. It's um, a I little think further. That the tale, the Logos of Odysseus, sorry, I'll start again. Yes, yes. I think that the tale, Logos of Odysseus, is greater than his experiences, Papa, all because of Homer, the one with the sweet words. Upon his lies, Sudea, and Egyptness, there is a kind of majesty, poetic skill, Sophia, misleading in myths, Musoi, deceptive, blind in heart on most men. For if they could have seen the truth, Aletheia, never would great Ajax, angered over the arms of Achilles, have been the burnished sword through his own heart. So, uh, thank you very much, Sarah. So wonderfully read. Um, so, I think that uh, using this very, uh, I would say, full of flesh passage by Gregory Nash, Nash uh, we can start uh, our discussion about the links that Pindar um, uh, builds or implies with previous uh, poets with the previous epic and lyric past. Uh, in a way, what I found most significant that we have to have in mind is that what Greg Nash says is that a typical Pindaric composition presents itself as local in foundation and as panhellenic in intent. In a way, this is how Pindar fashions his song. Uh, he tries to tailor every ode as local, but its intent to be Pan-Hellenic and uh, to um, address its audience both in its locality but also in its uh, connection with the rest of the Hellenic world and by the use of the term Hellenic world, world uh, I think we, we should always have in mind how Irad Malkin um, taught us to understand the Mediterranean world, that it is a world built through links, a, a world built geographically through colonies all over the Mediterranean, uh, through autonomy, but also uh, through contact and links with the metropolis, with the center or with the mother of the colony or the Apoikia. 
I don't know, are there any questions so far about uh, um, the way that I set my framework? I think that was clear. Let's see if anyone has any thoughts or comments yet. Oh, Bill, great. I was just going to comment. That's an excellent summary of the of the, the lyrical thinking in, in Pindar. Good job. Let's go. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now I will try to present you with some verbal coincidence that you've probably read. Um, between Pindar's uh, Pythian 3 and a Hesiodic and the Hesiodic version of Koranis. So why Hesiod is particular, particularly interested in, uh, in Koranis? Because as you all, as we all know, uh, Hesiod is particularly interested in genealogy. Uh, I think that the, the Mediterranean world, a world built through colonies, is built through geographical contact, but also through genealogical contact. So we have to remember the two G's, geography and, and genealogy. So uh, I think uh, what I'm going to present to you is uh, uh, action between and geography. So, in probably uh, Sarah is kind enough to show you um, this uh, verbal coincidence that I've noted. And um, so, uh, you, I will just guide you through this verbal coincidence. As I've already told you, Pindar's third Pythianot provides us with one of the earliest extant full account of Apollo's love affair with a young girl named Coronis. Coronis is the daughter of Phlegias, a Lapith king, which you can see in Pythian 3, verse 8, a vepo Phlegia to Thugater. This is how Coronis is being introduced in Pythian 3. And the other text uh, that discusses the genealogy of uh, um, uh, Coronis is uh, the fragment, the Hesiodic catalog of, of women, fragment, uh, the, the fragment that you that you see, uh, fragment 59, uh, if, uh, if I'm yes. correct? Yes. Uh, of Marie, can I ask, can you just say two words about what the Hesiodic catalog of women is? For people who yes, know? well, it's um, the, the catalog of women, the Hesiodic catalog of women, uh, is the... Um, text that focuses on mothers of heroes. And why mothers of heroes? Because uh, the matrilineage of a hero was very important in order to establish the ruling classes, not only of, of the Greek mainland, but also of the Greek colonies. And it was not only cities on Greek mainland that in a way traced um, their provenance or their ruling classes through heroes, but also colonies uh, needed to attribute their history, the way they came from, or why these colonies were built through a hero. Mm. Because they had to have an ideological myth why a colony has been established, for example, in Cyrene why a colony has to be established in Asia Minor, why a colony should have been established in the Black Sea region. So this connection between genealogy and geography is so inherent exactly. within the poetic system, right? Yeah, beautiful, thank you. Yes, that's why, we, as I keep repeating and you wonderfully stressed, genealogy and geography go hand in hand. Um, so, um, 
I will just uh, read you the previous passage, fragments, uh, the next passage, uh, the fragment 60 of uh, Catalog of Women, uh, which in a way includes a snapshot of Coronis' myth. At that time, a, me uh, a messenger came, a raven from the holy feast to sacred Pytho, and reported unseen deeds to unshorn Phoebus. Now, which were these reported unseen deeds? Uh, the Hesiodic narrative goes on that Ischis, Ischis is a guest in uh, uh, Coronis's father's palace, that Ischis had slept with Coronis, uh, he is Ella to his son, her the daughter of Zeus born Phlegias. And we have also in, uh, the verification of the Homeric hymn in Asclepios, of Asclepios, the healer of sicknesses, first I sing, son of Apollo, born in the Dotian place to the Lady Coronis, daughter of King Phlegeas. So what is the common uh, denominator between these two accounts? Is what I mentioned earlier, that uh, the Coronis is being designated with a standard reference, the daughter of Phlegeas. This piece of information accompanies Coronis' name in a formulaic way. Uh, for example, in, a Homeric, uh, in the Homeric hymn precedes uh, her personal name, Coronis. The noun, Kure, this is how Coronis is being called. And her paternal personal name in genitive, Phlegia. And her paternal status, Basileos. And in Hesiodic passage, it involves a preceding personal name in accusative, coronin, a paternal personal name in genitive, phlegual, and an adjective in genitive and a noun. However, um, self evident this information may be for texts of genealogical interest, such as the Hesiodic Catalog of Women, or for texts. Uh, of cultic interest, such as the Homeric hymn to Asclepius, it features as the only recurring one regarding colonies. It should also not escape our attention that this particular information, which remains unaltered in Pinder's account and maintains in its form like epic, also introduces the mythical narrative of Pythian III and comes as a, at a very early point uh, in the Ode. Uh, and I speak oh, again of uh, verse 8 in uh, Pythian 3. Now, second piece of information linked with Coronis is the fact that she lives in Lacaria, a city situated at the banks of Lake Boibias. This is uh, uh, verse 34. And uh, Pindar offers exact information on the girl's dwelling which uh, used to be Lacaria situated on the northwestern summit of the double hill rising out of the Dotius campus, the Dotion Pedion. And what is the Dotius campus? Is a plain in a wider area in Thessaly, in a plain in Thessaly situated south of mountain Ossa along the western bank of Lake Boibias. And Lake Boibias also features, as you, as you can see uh, in the handout in fragment 59, whose association with Coronis Oihe has been challenged by Martin West. Uh, he, in, uh, in your handout, you can see the exact coincidence between the two passages, between fragment 59 and Pythian 3. And uh, to this citation of world uh, parallels, I find extremely compelling to add that both in fragment 59 and in uh, Pythian 3, 25, uh, in fragment 59, um, Hesiod uses a very particular um, qualification. Coroni uh, he calls coronis avmes in a way, unattained. Uh, 
And uh, Pythium 325, uh, Pinar, um, uses a circumlocution he calls Lema Coronidos. Admis Parthenos is a formulaic phrase that usually denotes the social status of an unmarried girl. And in the context of the Hesiodic Fragment 59, the adjective admis caps the illustration of a carefree girl sitting at the bank of Lake Boybase washing her feet. Um, since Filamovic, many scholars consider Pinder's evident changes of Hesiod's version as exclusively a aiming at the aggrandizement of Apollo both as a god of infinite capabilities and of moral justice. And one of them, David C. Young, persisted with Pinder's revisionist stance towards Hesiod's version, arguing that Pinder's changes complement Apollo in general, but they also contribute organically to the composition of a coherent uh, poem. For example, according to Young, Pindar makes Ischis a foreigner so that the myth of Coronis provides manifest evidence of the truth of the general statement contained in verses 21-23 in Pythian 3 that uh, the, all the people strive to uh, unattained goals, but I will get back in um, uh, in short. However, the view has been adequately uh, refuted by Pelisias, Hayden Pelisias' nuanced and chromatically well-informed reading of the old, and given the wider framework created by the first word, ethelon, the unattainable wish, as expressed in Pythian 3, uh, which in a way pervades the whole ode. The notion of unattainability is in accordance with the pseudo epinician character of Pythian 3 as an elusive literary quality. A pseudo wish, such as Ethelon Kezoin, a wish Charon wa uh, were alive, which sets the tenor a false start recusatio, is expressed in the context of the pseudo epinician ode while the uh, mythical example is about a pseudo-virgin, and please note this big difference, a pseudo-virgin pregnant with the seed of Apollo and a pseudo-childbirth as is the case of Asclepius. Um, so, so far um, is uh, everything uh, clear? I mean, uh, would you like me to focus especially uh, on a particular aspect of the myth? Yeah, Jack. Yeah, Jack. Jack. Can you introduce yourself? Jack. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Jack. I'm Jack. I'm Jack. I'm Jack. I'm Jack. I'm Jack. In Houston, Houston. Texas. Uh, I I just uh, wondered how how does how does that uh, chasing uh, unattainable um, goals fit uh, with the dedicate of the of the ode. Oh, uh, uh, Jack, you just uh, asked the one million dollar question. <laughs> uh, I, I was uh, I, I was trying in a way to uh, postpone this. Uh, I think you, you hit the the. Uh, the of this particular uh, Pythian ode. Many people believe, uh, or, or let's say that the Alexandrian scholars, uh, or the way uh, the Pindaric corpus was transmitted to us, includes this particular ode as an Epinician ode, because it was written for Hieron, the famous tyrant of Syracuse. However, there are reasons to believe that this, in a way, is um, uh, a pith a, a, an Epinician ode which is uh, particularly focused on unattainability because, as I told you uh, in the beginning, um, Pindar's concern is locality in every sense. Uh, 
Loc not only geographical locality, but also he tries to tailor his Epinetian ode to the particular uh, situation of his dedicate or his own patron, in a way. Uh, we have information through the ancient scholia, and uh, you can wonderfully read more about this both in uh, uh, the introduction of Pythian 3 in the Lab Classical uh, uh, Library series, and also in Gregory Nagy's book, and in Hayden Pelicia's wonderful article uh, about Pythian 3, that Hieron. Uh, on this, uh, during uh, this particular time, um, felt uh, in a way unwell. So Pindar is trying to console him, or to show him, or to convince him by being reflective that there is limits to every human activity in every sense. Like Coronis is um, uh, a human example of, uh, I would say, is um, of, of a limit, that everything has a limit, uh, even human behavior has a limit. So in a way, uh, I think that the poet tries to imply that even here on athletic activity might or uh, uh, successfulness success uh, has a limit and I must say you are quite right that you might see a discrepancy uh, between the um, Yes, exactly. Unattainability of a woman reminds me, yes, of a Sapphos apple. Absolutely, absolutely, in every, every way. And um, I think this is uh, also what we can say, this is uh, what Sarah just uh, mentioned, uh, is an intratextual link between uh, Sappho and Pindar and, um, and other lyric poets. But in a way, an unattainability is, uh, one, is a literary concern, but also uh, a concern uh, or that um, was very central to Pindar's, to uh, his uh, patron's activities. Mm. Maria, can you? I'm wondering if any of the focus passages um, yes. that you have selected would help us yes, sort yes, of yes, look yes, at this yes. in specific detail. I, I can give you one particular. I have provided you with many, many passages. I would like, for example, to give you an example. Iliad 24. Um, could you just? Uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Sarah, if possible, to to read uh, this famous uh, passage of uh, the two urns. So Sarah's going to pull this up. So as Sarah's pulling this up and getting ready to read, I just want to share for everyone that um, all these ha handouts will be available on the Hour 25 website on the post associated with this event. So if you're watching this at a later point, you everyone can join in um, by following these handouts. Okay. Okay. Mm. Um, so I think there is. are set upon the floor of Asilis, a gift that he giveth, the one of ills, the other of blessings. To whomsoever Zeus that hurleth the thunderbolt giveth a mingled lot, that mean man meeteth now with evil, now with good. But to whomsoever he giveth but of the baneful, him he maketh to be reviled of man, and direful madness driveth him over the face of the sacred earth, and he wandereth honoured neither of gods nor mortals. Even so unto Peleus did the gods give glorious gifts from his birth. For he excelled all men in good estate and in wealth, and was king over the Myrmidons, and to him that was but a mortal, the gods gave a goddess to be his wife. So, in a many, many uh, ways. If, for example, um, uh, if, you, if you read, for example, this, uh, this passage along with 
um, uh, for example, uh, Pythium 3, uh, 85 to uh, 95, uh, you will understand that uh, uh, in, in this passage, uh, there are, for example, Homer provides the, the example of two urns, okay? Whereas in Pindar, we have the same example that uh, pin, that uh, uh, God uh, give three uh, goods and uh, evils to to the mortals. So in a way, uh, both Homer and Pindar go on to use pillows as paradigmatic of the blessing that uh, God give to men. And uh, I will ask uh, uh, Sarah to. Um, um, if you if you like, just to to read the next passage about Peleus' uh, son and the great uh, glory and uh, and prosperity. That uh, hand one in um, uh, the next uh, one, the one the one right below the two urns. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, um. So I can, as Sarah's pulling it up, I just want to ask a question, um, clarifying. So it seems that so the options there, right, mm -hmm. are basically you can have a mix of good, uh, uh, sorry, a mix of good and bad, or yes. or all bad, but all good is in an option. Well, un unfortunately, yes, things do not go uh, well during our life, uh, during our mortal life, and this is what uh, Homer and what Pindar uh, uh, believes. Um, in a way, I think that um, Pindar uses this concept of unattainability, as uh, I told you before, in order to uh, present us with, uh, um, I could say, a philosophy of life or how he thinks about life. Yes, thank you. Okay, so I think Sarah's ready. And Peleus' son, the only child whom immortal Thetis bore in fear, had his life taken in battle by the bow, and roused the wailing of the Danaeans while his body was burning on the pyre. But if any mortal has the path of truth in his mind, he must fare well at the hands of the gods as he has the opportunity. But the winds are changeable that blow on high. The prosperity of men does not stay secure for long when it follows, weighing upon them in abundance. I will be small when my fortunes are small, great when they are great. I will honour in my mind the fortune that attends me from day to day, tending it to the best of my ability. So what is interesting here, um, I think, is um, I would like you to have a look to what Pindar is telling us, uh, especially these uh, two last sentences. Like uh, what Sarah beautifully read, I will be small when my fortunes are small, great when they are great, and I will honor in my mind the fortune that attends me from day to day, tending it to the best of my ability. I think this should remind us of something. I don't know whether you can connect it mm. with um, Pindar's uh, uh, poetry, with Pindar's Epinician poetry, with Pindar praising uh, achievement, mm. uh, in a way. Yeah. I Does would like to. Uh, yeah. I would like to have your opinion, especially uh, about how would you, for example, how we could interpret tending it to the best of my ability. Yeah, anyone have a thought about that? So, Bill, I see Bill's hand is up. Bill, can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Bill Moulton from Petersburg, Alaska. 
you know, I find this whole conversation very ironic that we're talking about the unattainability and the limitations of life when we're talking about Asclesius, who got the lightning bolt twice, once in his mother's womb and later on after uh, uh, the whole s after uh, the whole Cyclops fiasco, um, and still attained godhood. Mm -hmm. it, it's ironic to me that he's telling the king and uh, the winner of the contest to, to know their place in life, not to look for other things, when his example is a character who attained everything a mortal could attain and more. Um, would you like... Would you like an answer or, or just a thought uh, about this? I'd like to hear like whatever a, you got. I'd like to hear whatever you have to say on the topic. We're here for a discussion. Yes. Well, I think that um, for um, uh, Pindar, I think that he the, the mythos the is not something definite definitive in the way we read it today. I think that every part of the story in um, in Pindar uh, is there for a purpose. When he narrates a story, for example, Asclepius' sto story, Asclepius he uses Asclepius as an example of unattainability. That even though Asclepius was the son of Apollo, and even though he has been awarded with the gift of uh, curing people, I think he reached his own limit by what? Doing what? What was Asclepius' greatest achievement? To bring bring people back from the dead. Exactly. And this is a realm that uh, belongs to someone else, sure. according to, to, to Pindar. So transgressions of limits is punished, and we all know, at least in Greek mythology, in Greek historiography, and in Greek, uh, you will allow me to say, in Greek theology, trans transgression of limits is being punished. Even though Asclepius was of divine origin, he should have known that the dead belong to a different realm, and his realm was to cure people while they are being alive or they were awarded the gift by fate to be alive, okay? It wasn't their fate to die in a way. So I think that this particular passage that Sarah has read uh, to us is extremely significant because it sets two um, prerequisites. First of all, that the prosperity is not secure for long. Yeah, and can we talk about that? The word that's there, right, is super interesting for our community because we've thought about yes. this word. Yes, it's yes. It's all of us, right? Yes, it's all of us. Yes, and I would like to hear more opinion, more opinions about about this. Like all of us, oak as Macron and drone erhetai saos, and please also. Uh, this saos, please note the qualification, saos means secure. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that, that same root is in the kind of words that we see for savior, right? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, same root. And then as you know, you asked us to think about those words for um, sort of tending, tending, um, tending to the best of my ability. Yes. yes. It. Um, and so, can you talk maybe just point out a little bit about that word? That's because that's a very interesting word. Uh, which word are you referring to now? Zerpeuan. Zerpeuan. Uh, uh, for tending, right? Sorry. Um, you. Um, again, could you please repeat back? Because oh, I can't... sure, sure, sorry. So I was just wondering if you could talk about that last line. You want to just talk about some of the key words that, that last line yeah. that you had pointed us towards. The demon askeso kateman therapevon mahanan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. Well, I believe that he has two um, very. Uh, first of all, the word demon. Okay. Right. Um, 
well, it's a media a media box. It can be interpreted either as fortune or as fate. In tragedy, it's um, um, it is sometimes it is translated as fate. Okay, but here demoni is fortune. Okay, mm. now ascesso is a very important verb. Okay, uh, because asceo, asco, means in a way um, like taking care, but also it means this everyday activity, the everyday training of an athlete. And also to th therapevon, therapon. Okay, it is someone who tends, but also therapeia is the cure that a doctor offers to a patient. Okay, and mahanan, okay, is not only the ability, is the inventiveness. Okay, may I uh, remind you the um, qualification? Uh, of Odysseus, Odysseus, or the attribute of Odysseus, Odysseus is being called polymechanos. So we find machanin in uh, polymechanos, Odysseus. Okay, so resourceful uh, Odysseus. So this same resourcefulness or inventiveness is found exactly here. So for me, these are the prerequisites uh, that a mortal should have in order to conduct his life through this long journey, through this long difficult journey that life is, uh, but also to, uh, in a way, to use or to um, well to, to use the challenges of life how he should respond to the challenges of life Beautiful. so anyone have any comments or questions so far on that passage or anything else that's coming up for them as they read this Jack are you I see you've moved forward are you looking to comment yeah, um, as Jack unmutes himself, um, you know, I just want to say, I think one of the things that's fascinating for me about this passage that I had never really noticed is how much it's resonating with um, Herodotus, right? This is something that we, these kind of ideas that we hear from Herodotus, and now I'm really thinking about those connections with Pindar. Um, yes, and uh, in, in many, many ways, for example, we found the notion of demon Demon, uh, demonos, yeah, uh, in uh, in the history of uh, uh, in the history in Herodotus's histories, mm -hmm. and uh, in many ways, I think it's not coincidental that one chapter of Greek Nages, Pindar's Homer, the lyric possession of an epic past, is, is also attributed to Pindar's connection or to how much uh, to, to, to this link between Herodotus and uh, Pindar. Yeah, yeah. Which you, can, which you may read it online through the C Harvard CHS website. Okay, thank you. So, Jack, we'd love to have your question or comment. Well, I, I, I thought uh, uh, this, this is all really very brilliant, uh, but uh, it, it seems to me that a lot of uh, Pender's Epinikia um, talk about the good and the bad um, as a sort of a consolation. Uh, uh, in, in one case, uh, he's he's consoling um, an exile uh, who's who's won a prize. Um, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm dealing with a family crisis situation here, and and I'm not not able to <laughs> to, to focus on my on my own question. Uh, but remember, there's a short uh, ode to. Uh, an Athenian exile, uh, which is and there. There are there are many there are many, for example, uh, situations where uh, uh, Pindar 
uh, deals with uh, uh, exiles. Uh, may I remind you, Pythian IV, uh, where he tries, he, he acts as the, as the go between between the tyrant and someone who has been exiled, or he has been the black uh, go, the, the the black ship of the political community. Now uh, this reminds me also of, of Ergotelis, uh, who comes from Crete, but he is he inhabits, uh, I think, a city in uh, um, in in Sicily or in uh, um, in uh, Magna uh, Grecia, and uh, he d th there are internal conflicts in these communities where Pindar t is trying to accommodate. That's why I think that it is really significant. That's why I I started. We started. Sorry, we started with reading what Gregory Nash is is um, saying about locality. Locality should not be interpreted only in geographical terms but also in social terms because Pindar takes into account all tensions uh, that abide within a community and he tries not to regl not to re uh, absolutely yes, uh, the the the, uh, the Persian invasion. Uh, this uh, this is exactly what the uh, team uh, is uh, is saying, um, and it is true that yes, this would drive the interest in both Panhellenism and the desire of tyrants to legitimize this. I'm quoting Tim to legitimize their cities through myth. This is absolutely true, but in a way that let's say that. The power, according to, to my opinion, okay, there was the tyrant, and the power sometimes we read the opinion odes top down. But we should also think that the opinion odes also reflect um, tensions that go uh, down up. And this is what uh, and Pindar does not try to hide them. He try or to uh, uh, under the carpet, as we say, but he tries to accommodate them, or sometimes to calibrate them. In a way, but the tensions are there. He knows about them, and he he doesn't want to give way to flattery. Although he he's he's a very self-aware po uh, poet, he knows it's uh, his distinctive uh, value. He knows that he is composing a note for a patron, but also he knows he, that he is a worthy uh, poet, uh, and he's almost, if not on the same level as uh, Homer, but he is self he is self-aware that he can emulate Homer. In many, many ways. Mm. And I think if you read Greg's book, you will see that this emulation is there. There's a, there's a little passage um, in, it's about just after line 75, yes. I think, of Pythian 9, which really jumped out at me. Yes. Great excellence can always inspire many stories. But to embroider a short out from a lengthy theme is what wise men love to hear. Right proportion, in the same way, contains the gist of the whole. Um, I think that that does sound it did sound to me as if he was comparing himself, but almost saying, "But actually, I'm better because I can do it." Yeah. Uh, well, so I, I've I've lost the, the last words of you, uh, Sarah. But I heard uh, what you just said. What you, what you rightly, what you beautifully, how you have. Have beautifully have spotted this particular um, uh, passage. I think that your interpretation is what caps uh, what the Pinder thinks of his own art, which is an art of winged words. Exactly what uh, we uh, we heard from Greg say, like epea pteroenda, but this epea has also the form of a statue. Like uh, uh, exactly as a statue of a victor, of a winner, who stands on the ground where the 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 athlete, as a victor, will always stand there. Uh, 
and commemorate his victory, this is what an Epinician ode is. is a, a statue through words that will travel all over. Yes, this is not one word. This is, this is what, if you go to Nemean 5, you will see that, how self-aware Pindar is as, as a poet. So uh, I don't think that, oh, and oh, the, the unique with Pindar we, is that we see, we have, for, for me, a unique glimpse. It's the first time that we have a unique glimpse of self-awareness at, at such an extent, extent, whereas in Homer we see that, that this is underlying. It's not as straightforward as Pindar. Mm. Yeah, I mean, can you talk about this idea of self? Oh, Jack, please go. Jack has his hand raised. Uh, the the machine slow and unmuting. Sorry. Uh, I I noticed uh, reading Pindar that more than once he says in the first person Ashnumai, uh that he is grieving. Uh, in in one case, it's a it's an ode that was written short shortly after the Battle of Salamis. Mm -hmm. uh, in another case, uh, the one I was thinking of a minute ago, uh, Pythian 7, uh, he says, um, uh, Achnumai, told I, uh, Nea Telpragia Cairo te told Achnumai. Um, mm -hmm. So he's, he's happy, he's happy for the man's victory but he is grieving for the man's uh, being um, cast away uh, from, from his homeland. Mm -hmm. uh, but but uh, he says that uh, for those who um, succeed, Thaloi's son, um, uh, steadfast, Parmon um, uh El Daimonia, for, for happy, flourishing, happiness, uh, steadfast, flourishing happiness, Ta Kai Ta are, are to be born, uh, you know, the, the good and the bad. And, and that's, that's, the, um, uh, that's the message you get over and over um, uh, reading Pindar to to seek, strive for excel, excellence, to um, enjoy the um, the cure of the pain of uh, hard competition and uh, what life brings, uh, even uh, gallstones or kidney stones, if that's what a Huron had, uh, to to. Uh, to take it all in, and and uh, as a, uh, someone told me early in my life, cut your jacket to your shoulders. <laughs> what do you say, Maria? That's a great comment, Jack. What do you say, Maria, about this? I, I would like to thank uh, Jack because I think he captured the essence of Pindaric poetry in in um, in what he in what he told us. I believe that uh, Pindar regards life in many ways as an athletic competition. Uh, an athlete always, um, a good athlete, okay, someone who is striving towards achievement. This is what Pindar uh, defines as an athlete's goal, achievement. But achievement can come only through toil this is what he believes, toil in many, many ways. But uh, after the athlete succeeds, he needs to be left, you know, to um, not only to enjoy, but to relax. He needs what he calls therapeia. He needs to uh, asclepion. He needs to, to put his, his limbs, for example, in some not hot, but you know, uh, to take a bath, 
as this is what he, he tells and, and and enjoy it even this relaxation after victory it is something worth enjoying because this is what life is like you just take a break and then you go on with competition and the thing is that he he's saying this not only to like he, he's saying this well let's re rephrase this he he's saying this to some very important people like the super rich of that era because Hieron may I remind you was not only a tyrant he was one of the wealthiest uh, people in the Mediterranean world during uh, Pindar's era okay so in a way Hieron had everything he had power he had wealth he had achievements, but he reminded him that even this kind of life has limits. So he, even Hieron, should be reminded of um, not transgressing these limits or respecting these limits. But always keep trying for achieving what is best. What has what is being called in Greek to Ariston? Best. Okay, so Maria, this is such a beautiful conversation, and I feel like you know we have so much more we could discuss. We have many, many more focus passages here that we haven't gotten to. Yet, what would you like to suggest? I would like. I mean, we can arrange another meeting, and we can go through the other passages that. Uh, uh, um, uh, that we have and uh, what I would like also to, to share with you, I would like to share your thoughts I think that as a, a, an hour 25 uh, I would suggest we should also think another let's say um, topic of our next meeting would how return defines the entity of a hero yes okay and how, how and especially by return May I remind you, uh, it's not me, there are many people who already, may I, may I remind you of Douglas, uh, Douglas Frame's beautiful book about Nostos and uh, Nestor and Nos and Naomi, like homecoming uh, as a return, as a defining moment of becoming a hero. Yes, yes. And so both of those texts are available on the CHS website under the publication section, so everyone can look for those. Douglas Frame. Um, Maria, I love your suggestion about continuing our conversation about Nossos. And uh, in fact, as, as we were just finishing up talking about these ideas like the mixed feelings of joy and sadness uh, that Pindar is talking about, I kept thinking about Nossos, right, where you often have these passages uh, where you, someone says, um, you know, someone rejoiced for their own coming, but at the same moment they're grieving for the people who did not make it home. Um, so these such, such interesting moments of, of those two. Please go ahead. Do you want to have a final last word as we think about this transition? I, I just would like, in in a way, to um, uh, uh, to add to what you you are beautifully putting, is that uh, even athlete as a hero should come back to its own city in order to be celebrated or to acquire the qualification of a hero uh, and by hero I mean someone who achieved the best in an athletic contest. Hmm. So, well, okay, well this is so timely, right? Because as we, th right now the Olympics are going on in Rio and uh, we're seeing these amazing athletes achieve uh, what seem like amazing feats. I mean it's a very different scenario but um, so they are going to have to make that return, right? And so yes, hopefully, I'm hopefully we can have a return with you, Maria, uh, to continue this conversation. Well, listen, we're going to follow up. We're going to set up a date. Um, I look forward to reading these passages with you. It's 12.05. We do need to sign off for overtime. Uh, and I do want to be respectful of people who are joining us, uh, especially people like Tim who are joining us. It's very late. <laughs> it's a different day where he is now. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, and we look forward to our next conversation. Take great care. Thank you very much. Thank you.